after a summer of rail strikes. Now fares are on the up. They'll rise by almost 2%, despite union claims they've gone up at twice the speed of wages. It's just been a nightmare, being delayed all the time, the cancellations. I mean, I just feel like it's really affected my working life, my personal life. Also this lunchtime, Mark Cavendish wipes out three cyclists in Rio, but keeps Britain's medal momentum rolling. Parents told to be open with children about the perils of nude selfies. And the chance encounter on Facebook and a visit to a Chinese orphanage that completed this American family. This is the ITV Lunchtime News with Charlene White. Good afternoon. It's been a summer of delays and disruption on Britain's railways. Yet today came news that fares in England, Scotland and Wales are going to go up. The rise is set by July's RPI inflation rates, which was confirmed today at 1.9%. It'll be added onto regulated ticket prices, including season tickets, from January. Unions say fares are going up at twice the rate of wages, with commuters having to pay more for less. But the rail industry says billions is being spent on improvement work and it's dismissed calls from Labour to renationalise the network, as Joanna Partridge reports. Different day, same commute. From Monday to Friday, Emma Bryant catches the 6.48 train from her home in Lewis in East Sussex to her work in London, costing her £500 a month. For several months, the Southern Rail Service has been plagued by problems. It's just been a nightmare with the strikes, the, um, the times being delayed all the time, the cancellations. I mean, I just feel like it's really affected my working life, my personal life. And there was more bad news for commuters this morning. The Retail Prices Index measure of inflation hit 1.9% in July. That figure is used to calculate next year's increases for regulated rail fares like season tickets. From the 1st of January, an annual season ticket from Cheltenham to London, which costs £9,800 now, will go up by £186. A season ticket from Birmingham to London currently costs £10,012 and will increase by £190, while travelling from Edinburgh to Glasgow costs £3,748 and will rise by £71. The TUC says fares have risen twice as fast as wages since 2010. British commuters already pay some of the most expensive rail fares in Europe. Trains at peak times like this one are often overcrowded and some routes are especially prone to delays. Many passengers feel that the service they get now doesn't live up to the prices they pay. And that's before next year's fare increases. Some accuse the train companies of putting profit and shareholder dividends before investment. We have a, a £50 billion uh, railway upgrade plan, uh, which is around a, a million pounds every hour, every day, uh, to invest in improving the railway, delivering better reliability so people get the information they need, they get a seat and their trains will arrive on time. Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn launched his transport campaign during morning rush hour. He says a Labour government would renationalise the railways and cut fares. This is not a sensible way of running a public railway system, which we have all paid for through huge levels of public investment in the track and the signalling systems. Renationalisation, if it happens, is still a long way off. For now, commuters who have to travel by train pay their fares and put up with the service they get. Joanna Partridge, ITV News. Well, in a moment, we'll get reaction from our consumer editor, Chris Troy, who's at King's Cross Station in London. But first, our Scotland correspondent, Peter Smith, who's by the fourth railway bridge just west of Edinburgh. And, and Peter, you've been spending time with commuters this morning. Is there a lot of frustration over this? A huge amount of frustration. And just to point out this, the fourth bridge behind me now in many ways represents the original ambitions of Britain's railways. When it was completed at the tail end of the 19th century, it was anticipated that rail would be the transport mode of the future, transporting more and more people over further distances and trying to do it faster. 
people are complaining that the modern rails in 2016 do not, do not live up to that original ambition. We're seeing people complaining that they're essentially paying more money for the privilege of having to stand for the duration of their journey. And just this morning, as you say, I followed one commuter, Ian Bertel, who was travelling from Dalgetty Bay on the other side of the Firth of Forth here. He was going to Edinburgh Waverley and he crossed the Forth Bridge here. He paid just over £9 for a return journey and it was about a half hour journey. He was lucky enough to get a seat for the last five minutes and this is what he had to say to us. They talk about investing that money for improvements and I think the only improvement I've seen at Dalgetty Bay where I get on is a, a, a larger platform and what I've seen since the value of taking the company over is that um, trains are actually reduced in size and not any longer. As I mentioned earlier, this is a, normally a six carriage train. It's down to four carriages and, and today it's down to three carriages and you can see obviously there's quite a lot of people standing. You just have to search the, um, the, the social media feeds for ScotRail. This is the, the franchise that runs the rails here in Scotland. And you'll find that this is a common complaint. People are saying that the carriage numbers have been cut back. I asked ScotRail about this. They say they're not hiding carriages. All of the, the carriages that they have at their disposal are on the rails just now. And they say they are investing in this. They say that within the next couple of years, there will be 20,000 more seats on Scotland's rails. They also say they have been investing in free Wi-Fi. So if you're unhappy about having to stand for your journey, you could always email them on your commute to complain. Peter, thanks very much. Well, let's talk now to Chris, who's in London. And Chris, we've heard from many commuters complaining that the service is getting worse. Is that the case, though? Do they have the right to be upset? Well, Charlene, I've, I've been looking at the very latest figures, which are, are for punctuality over the last four weeks. And actually, the number of trains on time has gone down a little. About one in 10 is not arriving on time. For many commuters in particular, many of which have paid hundreds if not thousands of pounds for their season tickets, um, that's simply not good enough. Uh, a recent survey suggested that only 61% of commuters were satisfied with punctuality and whilst reliability is the cornerstone of the network, a WITCH survey by the consumers organisation suggested that it's often the basics that these train firms don't seem to be getting right. Clean trains clean toilets and as we heard there with Peter and the passenger often overcrowding is a big problem and is undeniable within this industry. Well you mentioned that the basics Chris and renationalisation re is a word that tends to get used quite often when we're discussing this and that's what Jeremy Corbyn is asking for but is that the answer? Well, it, it comes round with the kind of regularity that any train firm would envy. Every time fares go up, you can guarantee that somebody will start shouting about renationalisation. Of course, this time round, a fuel has been added to the flames by new research from unions suggesting that shareholders' take has gone up 21% over the last year to £222 million. The problem with renationalisation is it's very expensive potentially. It would take a mountain of taxpayers' money to buy out the existing rail contracts. The only alternative, and this is something that Jeremy Corbyn has been talking about today, is to wait until the franchises already in place finish. Uh, but that could be a very long wait indeed. Some of those contracts go on for 19 years, so it could potentially be a solution, but certainly not a quick one. And one thing we know about rail passengers is they don't like waiting. Indeed, Chris, thank you very much. Well, if you want to know how much your rail fare has gone up by, there's a complete guide on our website. That's icefeet.com slash news. There's a prospect of another medal rush for Team GB at the Olympics today with golden chances in the sailing, cycling and gymnastics later. But the standards of the last week or so, by, by the standards of the last week or so, yesterday was relatively quiet for Britain. But the cyclist Mark Cavendish did win a silver in the velodrome after Charlotte Dujardin won her third Olympic gold in the dressage. It maintains the momentum at what is fast turning into one of our most successful games ever ever, as Sally Bidolf reports. Another day and more success for Team GB. It was a huge so night for cyclist history. Mark Cavendish, realising his dream of an Olympic medal with the silver in the men's omnium. Let's have a look at it here now. Oh. 
It could have all been very different, though, as minutes into the points race, the Manxman crashed into another rider, taking out three, including the leader and eventual gold medal winner, Italian Ilia Viviani. The race was momentarily stopped. Cavendish on the wheel. But Cavendish held his nerve and his decision to pull out of the Tour de France early to concentrate on Rio seems to have paid off. His silver followed a third Olympic gold for Charlotte Dujardin with a near-perfect dressage routine. She retained her title from London 2012 and was overcome with emotion when she won. Our women's hockey team also had a good night, winning their semi-final against Spain 3-1. They are now guaranteed a medal as they take on New Zealand in the final tomorrow. Attention this afternoon, though, turns back to the velodrome with British cyclist Jason Kenney going for his sixth Olympic gold in the Kieran, a race he's favourite to win. If successful, he'll equal Sir Chris Hoy's record. His fiancée, Laura Trott, will then follow for her fourth Olympic gold in the women's omnium. She's leading at the halfway stage. This golden couple of cycling could make history in the next few hours. Sally Bidulph, ITV News. Well, aside from Team GB, there was lots of other action in the stadium overnight, including a dramatic finish of the women's 400 metres final. The Bahamian sprinter, Shawnee Miller, looks like she would be caught on the line, but a dive meant she got there first ahead of the American Alison Felix. She said she had a few cuts and bruises, but it was worth it. And the host nation, Brazil, won their first gold medal of the Games after a stunning performance from Thiago da Silva in the pole vault. He broke the Olympic record on his way to winning gold. Our sports reporter Amy Lewis is in Rio for us this lunchtime. Amy, what can we expect from Team GB today? Well, we expect plenty more medals, I think, Charlene. When it comes to uh, Team GB, it's looking pretty good so far. Nicola Adams, who, of course, made history in London 2012 by becoming the first ever woman to win an Olympic gold medal in boxing, where she's going to be competing today. And if she wins her fight, then she is guaranteed a medal at the very least, and her final fight will be on Saturday. Also today, in the sailing out on the water, we're going to see Britain's Giles Scott. He's already guaranteed a gold after earning enough points on Saturday. Sunday. He's going to be competing out on the water in the Finn class, the same class that Sir Ben Ainsley won gold in back in London. Also today, as Sally mentioned, uh, Laura Trott is going to be competing in the cycling in the velodrome in the women's omnium. and she's after a fourth gold medal. And then finally today in the athletics, Laura Murr, she's going to be competing in the 1500 metres. She is ranked second in the world, so expect her to win a medal. Well, we seem to be winning medals and smashing records all over the place. Do you think we'll be talking about these games as uh, Team GB's most successful ever? We're certainly looking that way. The aim for Britain is to have the most successful away games. Just to put that into context, they need to beat what they did in Beijing, which was 47 medals overall. If you look at the medal table at the moment, we're second, which at this stage is pretty incredible. At the moment, we have 41 medals at the end of day 10. At the same stage in Beijing, we had 27. So we are way ahead of schedule. And then if you look at London, which was our most successful games overall, home or away, at this stage, we had 40. So, so so far, so good, and there's still six days to go. All right, Amy, thank you very much. Still to come, while the NSPCC is warning parents to be aware of explicit texting between teenagers and the remarkable reunion in China made possible by a chance sighting on Facebook. A new report has highlighted a substantial increase in hospital waiting times in England on the, and on-the-day cancellations of operations. The Patients Association says it's concerned about the psychological burden it causes those who have to rearrange procedures at the last minute. The government, though, says the figures are misleading. Well, our political correspondent Paul Brand is at Westminster for us. Paul, what exactly has the Patients Association said today? Well, they are expressing a lot of concern about this, Charlene. If these operations weren't daunting enough for patients, their figures do suggest things are only becoming ever more painful thanks to these longer waiting times. If you're going in for a routine operation like a, a hip or a, a knee replacement, you're not supposed to wait longer than 18 weeks. But they surveyed over 100 trusts across England. They found that actually last year, the number going beyond that target rose by something like 
80%. They also looked at what some of the five most uh, common procedures, found that the average waiting time for those is now over 100 days. That includes things like having your tonsils out. And perhaps the most worrying stat is that they found that on average now, hospital trusts across the country are cancelling something like 753 operations on the day every year. That's thanks to a lack of beds or a lack of equipment. So patients psyching themselves up for these operations only to have them called off at the last minute. Now, interestingly, the NHS only scrapped just last month fines for hospitals who break these targets. That's because, quite frankly, hospitals cannot afford to pay them. Too many of the uh, hospitals in England are uh, in the red. The Department of Health, though, saying these figures are incorrect. They say nine out of 10 patients uh, are seen within 18 weeks. However, you look at the stats, though, they will feel pretty painful for a lot of patients. OK, Paul, thank you very much. Labour MP Simon Danchuk has been arrested in Spain following an alleged incident involving his estranged wife. He spent the night in a police cell in Alicante. He was suspended from the Labour Party last year after allegations about his private life. Seven people have died and more than 20,000 rescued after record flooding in the US state of Louisiana. Thousands more are in shelters in the state's capital Baton Rouge after two feet of rain fell over the last three days. And 15 inmates from Guantanamo Bay Prison have been transferred to the United Arab Emirates in the largest single transfer of detainees in Barack Obama's presidency. Some had been held without charge for 14 years. President Obama had hoped to close the prison in his first year of office. The NSPCC is warning parents that they need to discuss sexting with their children because it's becoming more and more common and causing more distress. The children's charity says the sharing of explicit photos online is on the rise and its latest report reveals there are 1,400 cases of sexting reported to Childline each year. That's a rise of 15% from a year ago. And while most parents surveyed believed sexting is harmful, six in ten haven't discussed it with their children. Well, joining me now is Alan Wardle from the NSPCC. Thank you so much for coming in. Do you think it's a situation that where parents just need to get better at talking about sex and sexting, of course, with their children? Well, this is one of those conversations that parents don't really want to have but really ought to similarly to things like underage drinking or drugs. We know that um, this issue is on the rise. We know that parents are worried about it, but parents aren't very good at talking to their children about it. And actually helping children understand what the risks are, what can happen if these images go out of their control and what they can do about that is really important. I guess for a lot of parents, they'll sit there and sort of think, yes, but my child wouldn't do something like that. But is it important that they err on the side of caution? Absolutely. And not all children are doing this, but some are. They're sending images themselves or they're being sent images themselves that they don't necessarily want to see. And it's really important that children understand and realise that these images can be, could get out of their control. They can go around the school, which can be really humiliating, humiliating or even worse, can get into the hands of a sex offender. So it's really important that parents have these conversations with children and the NSPC has, NSPCC has just launched a guide today to help parents have that conversation. And a lot of parents, whether or not they realise, but you could actually be committing a crime by sexting, couldn't you? Yes, because technically, taking a, even taking a picture of this is creating an illegal image of a child. So children need to be aware of that. And also, particularly if it's sent, or and particularly if it's an image of someone else is sent without their consent, that's where children can get into trouble as well. But ultimately, it's about having conversations so children are aware of the risks, so they can take good decisions for mm. themselves. And if things do go wrong, they know how to get help and support. I mean, Childline said that they'd had 1,400 cases reported to them over the past year, but the real figure could be a lot higher than that, couldn't it? We don't really know what the true scale of that is. That's some children who have been sexting, some who are worried about it or their friends are doing it as well. So un understanding the real scale is a challenge here, but we do know it's on the rise. We do know that it's an issue that parents are worried about and that children are worried about themselves and helping them have that conversation together, which is what parents and children need to do about some of those awkward issues, is something that's really important. Absolutely. Well, Alan, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us. 
And finally, it was a chance encounter on Facebook that led to the most remarkable reunion today. American mum Lisa Lumpkins adopted a child from a Chinese orphanage three years ago. But whilst online, she spotted the picture of another child who looked just like her daughter. A few phone calls to China and a DNA test later, it was confirmed the two girls were in fact sisters and today they were reunited. Our China correspondent Debbie Edward was there. 13-year-old Avery was born with cerebral palsy and abandoned by her parents. This afternoon, after an anxious wait at the Guangzhou Adoption Centre, she was greeted by her new American family. Very pretty. With mum Lisa joining on the phone from Kentucky, Avery was met by her father, Jean, two of her new sisters and little brother, Noah. Her life's going to be really good. You know, she'll have a lot of the memories that, you know, we've had growing up, you know, high school and, you know, friends and the internet and, you know, just, we want to give her a, a chance at a really good life. Avery has spent most of her life at the state orphanage in Shenzhen. In two days' time, she will turn 14 and no longer be eligible for overseas adoption. Knowing that birthday was fast approaching, an American volunteer at the orphanage appealed online for a family to help. The post was seen by Lisa Lumpkins, who immediately saw the resemblance with her adopted daughter, Aubrey. A DNA test confirmed that Avery was in fact her older sister. Had that post not been put on Facebook, they would have never known. You know, Avery would have aged out and she would have been stuck in well, not stuck in China. She would have been stuck in the orphanage. You know, that would have been her life for the rest of her life. Mom, we need you to take another picture. Avery appeared a little overwhelmed by all the attention today. She was not aware of the race to find her a family, but soon she will be on her way to America to be reunited with the sister she <laughs> never knew she had. Debbie Edward, ITV News, Guangzhou, okay. Southern China. And a reminder of our main story this lunchtime. Rail fares in England, Scotland and Wales will be going up by 1.9% from January, despite a summer of train delays and disruption. Unions have criticised the proposed increases, saying commuters are paying more for less. Well, that's it this lunchtime. Mark Austin and Mary Nightingale will be here with the ITV Evening News. The news where you are follows the national weather. But from everyone here on the lunchtime team, goodbye. <laughs>